to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, last week we saw the Song of Moses and both the warnings as well as the prophecy within it. And now we look at, uh, it's hard for me to call them blessings because some of them don't sound like they're blessings uh, to the, uh, some of the tribes. Uh, the list of the tribes of Israel is mentioned over 20 times in the Bible. And, never, and they are hardly ever the same, listed the same way. Some of them are left out. You can count up to 14 tribes, but uh, uh, there's, in the list, there's usually either they will bring Ephraim and Manasseh together and just have one tribe, or they will leave some out. And there's for various reasons they do that. And we'll try to look at some of that tonight. But uh, we see now that uh, the blessings of Moses and the blessings of Jacob are kind of intertwined. So if you want to just uh, put your finger in uh, Genesis chapter 49, then uh, we're going to try to compare some of these things as the blessings of Jacob and the blessings of Moses. Now, it, it, this is the blessing which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and, da and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with the ten thousands of saints. Now, that's kind of interesting. Um, the Lord came with not only angels, but saints. And so those who had gone before them. Um, and he says, uh, from his right hand uh, came a fiery law for them. Yes, and of course we know the, the law came with, from the fire on the mountain. Yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hand. Um, they sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. And then Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage for the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun. Jeshurun is a kind of an ancient, kind of an alternative name for the people of Israel. Uh, when the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. And now he starts listening to them. Reuben. Now, Reuben uh, was the firstborn. And we see that he says, it says to him, live and not die, nor let his men be few. Now, it's kind of interesting because we got, if we turn back to the book of, of Genesis, or to, you know, Genesis 49, we see now that the Lord talks to Reuben. And he's kind of, it's, it's not even a blessing to him. But in verse 3, he says, Reuben, you are the firstborn, my might and my beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and excellency of power, unstable as water. You shall not excel. And this is one of the tribes that we never find any heroes. There's no heroes and judges. There's no really spectacular feats that anybody from the book of, or from the tribe of Reuben ever did. Uh, and also, they were one of the tribes that, the only one or two of the tribes that in the book of uh, Numbers, uh, from the two countings, both before and then the 40 years after, that decreased. And they did decrease. And, and so uh, the Lord, uh, Moses is saying, may you not be few. In other words, uh, you are, you know, may you not shrink anymore. But at, the same, but at the same time, we see that it's just a very brief, uh, uh, may you live long and not die. And so uh, Reuben, of course, had taken the east side of the Jordan. So he was in danger already. And they did have problems. They were one of the tribes that just got trampled over and over again uh, from the Moabites and the, and the Amalekites and all the rest that were on that east side of the Jordan and the south side, and of course they were the southernmost side on the east side, so they were always the one that really got uh, clobbered by the armies that would come through. Now it's interesting, the second that we see is Reuben, excuse me, is Judah. Now Judah means praise. Isn't it interesting? The Lord came from uh, the tribe of Judah, and he came from the tribe of praise. And so uh, we know that he says, this he said to Judah back in chapter 33, Three, uh, he says, Hear, Lord, uh, the voice of Judah, and bring him to his people. Let his hand be sufficient for him, and may you be a help against his enemies. 
Well, that's not much, but Judah had already gotten a lot of space back in chapter 49 of the book of Genesis. And we talked about that this morning. Uh, one of the great, one of the key prophetic passages has to deal with Judah even back then. If you remember Judah, he was the fourthborn. But the first three had, uh, had forfeited their rights to be, to, to be a firstborn position. Uh, Reuben had uh, really uh, family affairs with, his, uh, with his, uh, uh, his wife's concubine or with, uh, with Jacob's concubine. And God never forgot that. That was a, a very serious problem. And so he forfeited the right of the firstborn. Then we have Simeon and Levi and how they were very upset. We'll, we'll see them in just a moment. They are, in, they are blessed together in Genesis. And then in the book of, uh, of Deuteronomy, we see that Simeon, as we've, we've had a lesson on that one time, or a message on that, how that Simeon, even though he was cursed, because he always wound up on the right side of the controversies, remember the golden calf incident and other things that happened, and he was always and they had to, they, with Balaam and others. Uh, he was always on the right side. And of course, he didn't inherit the land. As uh, we see back in chapter 49, you're not going to inherit uh, a large portion uh, together. You're going to be scattered throughout. And so... Levi, of course, that turned into a blessing. And some of the great men of the Bible, whether it was Samuel or, of course, Moses or John the Baptist, they came from the tribe of Levi. But it's interesting, in the book of Deuteronomy, Simeon isn't even mentioned. It's one of those things where so they try to come up with 12 tribes, so you have to leave one of them out because there's 13 if you count uh, Reuben, uh, count uh, uh, Jacob's two sons, Manasseh and, and, um, and um, Ephraim. And so we see that uh, Simeon is totally left out. Now we know that Simeon was absorbed or he was taken and he had his portion within the tribe of Judah. And he didn't totally disappear because over in the book of Chronicles, and that's the reason you, people who study these things, uh, you can find that uh, in the time of Hezekiah, there was a list of, of, of very important people, or at least a, a group of people, that did the work for the Lord, and they came from the tribe of Simeon. So, but they were, they were a nobody tribe again. Reuben and Simeon, but the first two tribes, didn't have any, any heroes. Nothing really was mentioned of them other than uh, uh, they were listed. And, of course, uh, God never forgot them, but he didn't really bring them to the forefront. So we see that uh, Levi, though, as uh, you, we look at him, he's on down the list when you look at uh, him in, um, uh, in the book of, um, of Genesis. But, uh, of course, now, I, I think I got ahead of myself. Actually, the, but the second tribe that you mention here in the book of Deuteronomy is not Simeon or Levi, but it is Judah. Because Judah is going to be the lead tribe. And uh, we see that as you go back to uh, Judah really took charge of the situation with Joseph. And uh, how that he and Reuben, to Reuben's credit, one of the only things we ever see him doing well, is to spare those two, uh, to spare him from death. And they sold him into, um, into uh, Egypt, of course, or into slavery. But, uh, at least, but then we see later on that Judah really took charge about with his dad and said, we got to go back and rescue Benjamin. And he said, he even said, I, I will stake my life on it. And so we see that uh, Judah became a, a strong person. But back in the book of, of Genesis now, we see that uh, what we mentioned this morning and that, um, that he talks about in verse 10, the scepter. Of course, that's the king's one, uh, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. In other words, being born from, from him. And so that is Genesis 49. And so we see that uh, that is one of those key verses that uh, the rabbis understood. And I mentioned this morning how that uh, there was a procreator uh, before, uh, before 
um, Pilate in the book in uh, about six, uh, six years before the time of Christ. And he was before Pilate, but he was the one who decreed that there would be, that Israel could no longer, the Sanhedrin can no longer have the death penalty. They, it would have to come through Roman government. And so Pilate was the one who inherited that. But so the Jews, of course, especially when Herod came on, uh, they said, we don't have the power. The scepter has passed from us. And uh, little did they know that, no, there was a boy up in Nazareth that was growing up that had the scepter. And he came from the tribe of Judah. And what a, what a blessing that is. You study the history there and you put the timelines and all those things together. God's word never fails. And uh, that's the one thing about studying things like genealogies and, uh, and the blessings. There's nothing in the Bible that's, uh, that is uh, just put there at random. Uh, no, God, it is God's word. In fact, someone has done the study, and I, I, I be, I'm careful with numbers. So people like, there was a guy named Darby and others that went too far with them. But uh, there, there's a saying that, that every, what is it, 13th, whatever, there, the name Jehovah, uh, every time that you, uh, the, uh, every 22 letters in the uh, Old Testament, the Hebrew, it will spell, it will spell uh, the name Jehovah. I mean, in other words, it will come up within those every 22 letters, which is the, the number of the alphabet. I don't understand all that, but uh, it's just interesting how that everything in the Bible, no, there's not one jot nor tittle of the Bible that wasn't designed by God. Now, we don't like to study the begots and all that, and I, un I understand that because if you don't understand them, if we don't know really what's going on, but there's a gold mine in each, uh, so many of these things. And so, and this is some of the things that you find, like uh, uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, literally has come true. Of course, the scepter is still with Judah, and his name is Jesus, and he's sitting on the right hand of the throne of God today, is he not? Does he have power over life and death? He does. And so that has never passed, and it never will. And so we see that... Uh, uh, these things are very important. And so we see that uh, here, old Judah, he talks about uh, uh, let your hands be sufficient for him. So he's talking, uh, the idea now that, uh, that Judah is going to be the lead. He's going to be the, you know, over the enemies, he's, he's going to be the, 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 ma the main tribe. And then we see after, so you have the first three is you have, uh, you have Reuben, and he's not going to be much. Judah is going to be the leader. And then you have Levi, who's going to be the spiritual leader. And he's the next one uh, that is mentioned, although his brother that was cohorts with him in that savage attack uh, on Shechem and where they killed the whole town, uh, they would be judged for that. But Levi's curse turned into a blessing. His, his curse back in chapter 49 is that you're not going to inherit the land. You're going to be scattered throughout the land. In chapter in the, in uh, Deuteronomy, after those forty years and the, and of course over four hundred years, uh, we see that uh, Levi has developed into one of the main tribes because of their stand. And folks, that's, that's why I like to say, uh, if God there's a curse of sin upon us, but when we get things right with God, we start walking with Him. He could turn those curses into blessings. And so there's no one out there, oh, you, Pastor, you don't realize what I've done. No, but God does. And you, he knows more about what you and I both have done than both of us put together. And so, but if you will get things right with God, he has a way of even turning your weaknesses into strengths. And he can turn your, your uh, curses into blessings. And we see that with Levi. And with Simeon, Simeon was always on the wrong side. It was always he that was one of the tribes that got, to, that got the most punishment because they were always on the wrong side. And so as a result, they're even left, he's even left out of this blessing here. Um, and we see that uh, with uh, uh, Levi, we notice in verse, uh, in the last part of verse 8 of Levi, uh, that your, Urim, your th uh, Thuman and your Urim 
uh, will be for the Holy One. This, we, that is one of the mystery, mysteries of the Bible that nobody has totally figured out. But uh, the priest uh, on their chest had a, had a, a position for Urim and Thurman. We don't even know exactly what the material was. But it was a way of discerning the will of God in so many ways. And so, uh, and we see that, um, and you were tested at Massa. I mean, you were tested out there in the wilderness. And, and you came through. And when you contended with the waters of Mirabah, remember the bitter turning into sweet. Uh, and, says, and who says of his father and mother, uh, I have not seen them. Now, this is a reference to the fact that uh, they were not able to go to funerals if you were a priest, remember? You couldn't touch a dead body. And so uh, they were, in spite of the fact that they could not even attend a funeral, the high priest couldn't anyway, to, of a, a funeral of a, of a loved one, God blessed them through this. And so we see that um, in verse 10, he says, they shall teach Jacob. Your, your judgments and Israel, uh, your law. And of course, we know that uh, many of the, not only the, did the priests and the Levites come from Israel, but many of the prophets came from Israel. Samuel was a prophet, was, was a Levite. Elijah and Elisha were uh, Levites. Uh, John the Baptist, as we've mentioned. Isaiah was a Levite. He was a priest. Remember, he saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. And so there were a lot of people that taught the law of God from the tribe of Levi, both priests as well as uh, prophets. Now, a prophet did not have to be a Levite, but a priest did. But here we see that, uh, that, um, that God greatly used the Levites, just like Moses said he would. They would be teaching the people. Then we see he goes all the way down to the baby of the family. And that is in verse 12, and Benjamin, uh, in chapter 49, uh, excuse me, chapter 33 of uh, Deuteronomy, he says, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Now, what does that mean? For one thing, uh, you realize that the, the city of Jerusalem was not in the tribe of Judah, within the boundaries of Judah. It was in the it was in the boundaries of Benjamin. And many people believe that's where this talks about that it shall. Jerusalem uh, was bound between Mount Zion and, uh, the, uh, and the Mount of Olives. And so that many people believe that that's a reference to that, you know, that valley, or actually that area right between those two that, uh, that Jerusalem was. But as, as well as, uh, of course, that they would be um, in trade. Now, we know that, uh, that Benjamin was a very, in fact, he's called a lion's whip and other things in, uh, in uh, Genesis. But uh, he was a, they were very warlike. Think of uh, Paul. Was he, a, was he a just a, a passive milk toast? No, he was a warrior, wasn't he? And uh, one of the unique things about the uh, Benjamites of old uh, they were left-handed, and uh, they could fight with either their left or their right hands. They were ambidextrous, actually, but they were, they were good with slinging sl stones with their left hand, and all these things that you find out about them. And yet, uh, and they were, uh, but the, one of the things about them also is that once they got right, and even after all the problems that happened with Saul, who was a, was a Benjamite, the first king, they became the loyal tribe that stuck with Judah for the rest of their history. Remember when they split up? Who stayed, who stayed with Judah? Benjamin did. And so we see that uh, they were greatly blessed uh, as a tribe. And then you have the tribe of Joseph. And of course we know that's more than one tribe. There were two. There's a great story there of how that, um, that uh, Ephraim was the younger. And yet when Jacob gave the blessing to them, he crossed, their, crossed his hands, and actually he was adopting those kids into, as his own sons, which made them part of the tribe of Israel. So his grandsons became his adopted kids for legal purposes of, of passing on the blessings. And so 
Ephraim and Manasseh were legitimate tribes. They were not uh, just sons of a, of a chieftain, but they actually were the sons of Joseph. And so we see that, uh, and Joseph said, blessed, uh, he, said, uh, he said, blessed of the Lord is the land with the precious things of heaven and with the dew and deep lying beneath. And he goes on and he talks about how that uh, the, the harvest and so forth. And then talks about the mountains. Notice in verse 15, the best things out of the ancient mountains. The richest, some of the greatest farmland even today is where Ephraim and where Manasseh had their tribes on the west side of the Jordan and even on the east side. But uh, again, uh, we see that uh, God greatly blessed uh, these tribes. You know, I'd like to talk a little bit. You can see that he gives a lot of space to these two. And, but uh, we'll try to get through this. But notice he says in verse 16, And with the precious things of earth in his fullness and, of, and favor of him who dwelled in, uh, in the bush. Um, and the blessings uh, come from to the, on the head of Joseph. Now Joseph... As far as the blessings, he wasn't the lead tribe, but uh, he did receive the double blessing of his two sons getting, getting the land. It's kind of a complicated thing there, but uh, as far as the inheritance, he got a double portion of the inheritance. And we see that uh, uh, his glory, he, uh, talks, excuse me, says, and his glory is like a firstborn a bull, and his horns like the horns of a wild ox, so they're strong and uh, so forth. Um, and in verse, in the last part of that verse, he says that um, they, um, there are ten thousands of Ephraim, and there are thousands of Manasseh. Now Manasseh was older, and yet, what does he mean by this? Well, Manasseh was one of the largest tribes, and they were noticed there was a half tribe on each side of the Jordan. Ephraim was a smaller of the tribe, but he was now designated firstborn, the crossing of the hands. Ephraim would be, become the major tribe of the northern ten tribes. And Ephraim, of course, we see that it's synonymous. Sometimes you will see, um, or many times, you will see the prophets especially called the northern ten tribes Ephraim. It's like... Uh, you know, what is that, a synecdoche or whatever, when you name one, uh, the one portion is uh, identified as a whole. Uh, that is a synecdoche, is that one of those eight uh, things? But whatever. So whenever you mention, it's kind of like uh, uh, we've talked about, uh, when you talk, if you're over in Europe and you say Washington, D.C. says this, you're thinking about the whole country, right? That's a synecdoche. Uh, and then you have the object, which is, well, let's not get into all that, but I won't give you an English lesson right now. But uh, so we see that, uh, that, uh, but that Ephraim is going to be a major tribe. Then we talk about Zebulun. Now he's on the coast. And rejoice, Zebulun. Uh, he's one of the, uh, the children of Leah. He says, you're, for you're going out. And Issachar, in your coming in. These are the two that are on the coast. And... Uh, they shall call the peoples of the, uh, to the mountains and they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. And these were uh, very, uh, and, those, and the treasures and treasures are hidden in the sand. And there again, along that east, uh, western coast of Israel, for one thing, they're finding all kinds of chemicals, silicon, uh, the Jews have been good at uh, uh, developing all kinds of different things that are coming from the sands. And then we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But uh, then we have Gad. And of course, Gad, he said, uh, blessed is he who enlarges Gad. He dwells like a lion. But Gad was a very strong, uh, he was one of the, one of the uh, tribes that produced uh, people like Jephthah. And I think Gideon was from Gad also. They were warlike people, but they were on the, no, the remember, they were on the northern eastern side of, Jordan, of the Jordan. And yet uh, they were a very, uh, God blessed them. And he provided uh, uh, for himself and talks about the law giver's portion. Um, then we have Dan. And here's another interesting one. Um, Dan was judge 
And we see he's like a lion's whelp back in Genesis. And if you want to read that, we don't, we're starting to run out of time. But uh, in, in um, Genesis, we see that he is uh, described as a serpent who bites the heels of horses and makes them back up and buck their uh, riders off. So Dan has always been one of those disruptors. Um, and we notice he's mentioned here, and uh, he's like a lion's whelp. We, and that uh, he shall leap from Bashan. Now we know later on that uh, he was given land down in central coastal area of, um, of Israel, but uh, he said it was too small. So he was the tribe that moved all the way to the north and to the extreme north. And of course he was called, uh, uh, whenever he's talking about Dan to Beersheba, you're talking about all the way from the front, you were talking about from Seattle to Miami. You know, Dan, excuse me, Dan being the very north and uh, Beersheba being the very south of Israel. And so he moved up to that area. Now, Dan has always given a short shift. Notice he doesn't get much here. He didn't get much whenever we find out uh, about his descendants. There was only a couple of words said about a couple of his boys back whenever the, the, uh, the list was given of all the people that went into Egypt. And that was one time where Joseph was left out because he was already in Egypt. So that's one of, the, another, one of those lists where people was left out. But Dan, uh, there's two other places that is very concerning about Dan. Um, and that is, he's not even mentioned in Chronicles. First Chronicles, remember all the so-and-so begot so-and-so and so-and-so begot so-and-so. He's totally left out. And there's another place that he's totally left out and that is in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, that 144,000. There's not a tribe of Dan in there. And he's replaced by, you know, one of the, either Levi or the sons of Joseph or whatever. Uh, so we've got 14, so you can take a couple of mountains still. I have 12 tribes. Uh, that's going to be interesting with, uh, if the, uh, uh, the foundations of the walls of Jerus the New Jerusalem are going to have the names of the 12 tribes. I'm wondering which 12 it's going to be. Somebody's got to be left out or consolidated or whatever. Uh, but God doesn't tell us. But um, some people even believe, and some Jewish scholars believe, that the Antichrist may come from the tribe of Dan. And so, uh, but, the, but one thing has been so surprising to me in the last several years, and especially with the, the war that's going on now and what was caused, is the number of Jews today that are pro-Hamas. It's just amazing. And then you've got people like George Soros, who is a Jew. He is a survivor of the Holocaust, one of the richest men in the world, and he's doing everything he can to destroy anybody who supports Israel. It's just amazing. I don't understand that. Uh, and yet, and we'll leave that to God. And uh, who knows the mind of man? Who knows the heart of man? And uh, well, I wonder if George Soros was from the tribe of Dan. We won't know that until the Lord straightens out the genealogies in the book of Revelation. And most Jews wouldn't know who, who they're from today, what tribe they're from. So uh, we have Dan. And then we have Naphtali. And here's another great one. And now, uh, several, of course, you've got Zebulun, back in Zebulun. Zebulun, he talks about uh, how that's going to be fruitful and so forth in the peoples. That's where Nazareth was. But now with, uh, we have uh, Naphtali. And uh, we know, as he said, Naphtali shall have favor, full of blessings, and possess the west and the south. And we know that he's going to provide royal dainties, if you turn back and look in chapter 49. The idea that he was going to be a supplier of a lot of the materials, both food as well as material, for the temple during Solomon's time. He was right down right there with uh, Sai. Uh, Tyre and Sidon, so he would get the blessings of those seaport cities. But um, then Asher, and this is another, and each one of these has a history that I wish I had the time to go back and really study or find someone who has done it. Now, some of the people that I've gone through will come out with some of them, but they, won't, they don't have a list of all of them. But Asher, I just learned this past week, is most blessed of the sons. Let him be favored by his brothers. Do you remember uh, 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 Anna, or Anna, was from Asher. 
And one of the things about Asher, they were noted, that even they, in Jewish history, they had the best looking ladies. <laughs> and Anna was one of Anna, Anna, Anna I better watch out, but uh, don't want to get anybody embarrassed. But uh, uh, she was, uh, of course, uh, in the temple, and she was one of the ones, her and Simeon, it's interesting, his name was Simeon, even though that tribe was a uh, lower tribe, and both of those were looking for what? The Messiah. They knew. And if you look, and they've done the numbers on it, they could know exactly the day that the Lord Jesus entered the temple on a mule. And there again, that's a whole new study. But, uh, you know, it, it comes out just exactly when the Lord Jesus entered it from the prophets, from the Old Testament. And uh, you say, well, Pastor, you've given me a lot of stuff you have backed up. Okay. I'm sorry, but uh, you know, we don't, how long do you want to stay here? And plus, uh, I haven't really studied it all myself, but I have been, I'm just leaning on people that I trust of what they're saying there. But, uh, but we see with Asher another thing, and that is, blessed be his sons, for let him be favored by his brothers, and let him dip his foot in oil. There's been a lot of speculators through the years that have uh, uh, tried to get people to... Uh, to invest in uh, uh, western Israel the, along the coast there because uh, they think that oil is there and now they've dis discovered oil and natural gas there and not only now this originally uh, uh, or uh, overtly was a great o olive o oil region a great olive olive oil and so forth of course we know the olive trees and so forth but Asher was one of the major exporters of olive oil. But also, we know that the port of Haifa is here. And Haifa uh, has got a, an interesting uh, history. Uh, it is one of the major seaports down from Sidon and uh, uh, on down from Syria on that, and to Israel. And it's still a major seaport today. But uh, back in the 1800s, uh, there was a man named John D. Rockefeller who, uh, after he got over his greed and really turned to some critical, I'm not sure, I've tried to study Rockefeller. I'm not sure he was saved, but he definitely was influenced by Christianity. He got down to one point in his life where his, he had, uh, where, uh, of course, he was the one that said, well, if you, you have the, you're the richest man in the world, what else would you want? What did he say? Remember, just a little more. But he was down to eating uh, just crackers and milk. That's what they thought would take care of ulcers back then. Of course, we find out that milk is not good for you today as far as ulcers are concerned. But uh, then somebody introduced him to the Word of God, and he started studying about giving. And he started the Rockefeller account and all the things where he started giving his money away. And guess what? He got over his ulcers. But uh, one of the things he found out was that, uh, you know, you study Babylon and that area over there, uh, there's a lot of tar, and they made mortar out of the tar uh, in building those walls of Babylon and other places. He said, tar is from oil. And so he was one of the ones who spearheaded, he had already made his money in Pennsylvania and everything, to go over, and they discovered oil in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia. They had no idea the oil that they were sitting on, and that was all from, you know, a guy that just studied a little bit about, about the Bible. And one of the things that they did was they built a pipeline. I think it's still gone. It's not been blown up. But uh, all the way from that area of Babylon and that area, all the way across to the port of Haifa. And so Haifa is one of the richest areas in the world as far as exports and so forth. And it, uh, does that mean he's going to dip his foot in oil? I don't know exactly. But uh, there again, an uh, olive press, I'm sure literally that's what they would do back then. But, um, and we see in his sandals shall be from bronze. And here's one of those verses we all like. After all this, he says, and notice he's the last one, not Benjamin, the baby, but uh, Asher. As your days, so shall your strength be. Anybody heard that verse? It comes from the blessings of even Asher. But as long as you're, as long as you're, uh, in the land, as long as you're with me, your strength is going to be strong. And Asher was one of the stronger tribes. 
And, so, and of course, uh, even one of the richer tribes because of the great blessings that God placed on them. And then we see the great uh, the benediction as we would turn. And, you, and of course, I told you to turn to Genesis 49, but uh, uh, I want to get to the end of the chapter here. So, so uh, we'll have to kind of skip over some of those things. But notice in chapter, uh, verse 26, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to help you and his excellency on the clouds. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Now it's interesting how that he said that. First of all, he says that he rides upon the heavens. Of course, heavens and the earth. And you think about the heavens, and of course the psalm, psalmist mentioned the heavens uh, multiple times, dozens of times. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork, uh, Psalm 19. In Psalm 8, we see that he stretched out the heavens and he fixed the world. In fact, um, in chapter or in Psalm uh, 8, verse 3, he says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers. Now again, there's a man that I studied that uh, knows a whole lot about astronomy. And so he took that, he said, do you realize what that God is saying here? That God made those huge stars up there. There's a couple of stars and he mentioned them. I don't know all about all these Andromedas and all this, but he kind of got me lost in the names of them. But he said, there's a, there's a star uh, it's not Orion, it's one of the others. But uh, it is so big that you can place the sun in it and put and, the, and have the orbit of the earth go around the inside of it. It is so big. That is a huge star. And that star in the heavens is moving at over 100 miles an hour. Over 1,000 miles an hour. Now... Folks, I don't know. How does God do that and not have stars banging up against each other? Just all the things that he does, the power. Now, think about uh, my, your car. I mean, you got a little, uh, this morning I had to get up and I turned on my car. And you just, uh, that is so sickening feeling, isn't it? You turn on the switch or whatever, you push the button or all the things you do today and nothing happens. Does that bother you? The power is gone. But uh, then you, you think about, uh, and what can I do with my fingers? I can't move my car one inch with my finger. And yet God made the earth and the heavens with the works of his fingers. Just think what he can do with his hands. And just think how safe you are in his arms so notice the, how the Moses brings this out he says who rides in the heavens to help you, you know, is God out there in, in, in Orion or the Milky Way or the Big Dipper he's out there because he's eternal present and he made them and yet he can come and talk to me and work with me individually. That is, uh, that is a God beyond, beyond comprehension, isn't it? He keeps the, the, the moon and the stars in place. We sing those songs. So here we have a God who is so strong and so majestic, and yet he does, as we sing that song, Almighty God, how wonderful art thou, or how, and yet to, uh, to how, the, how can you, when you think of the stars in outer space, how can you deal with a person like me? And so, and this is what Moses is bringing out. He says, no one like God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to help you and in his excellency on the clouds, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Now, there's two words here that are interesting. Eternal comes from a word meaning, uh, which is the root word is east. In other words, from the beginnings, the beginnings of day as we would know it. And when we think of eternal, we think of 
eternity as eternity past to present. He's always been here. And of course, we think of it totally, but uh, really that he's always gone. And of course, that's what the Lord told him. I've gone before you. And he told Moses that. And here we see that, um, that eternally, he's always been around, folks. He, he, knew, he knew you before the foundations of the world. Well, you don't know about that, Pastor. I'm a mistake by the lake. They told me that, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Well, no, in spite of all that, in spite of some of the tragic ways that some of us have come from, God knew and his blessings can be upon you today as we turn to him. Is that not true? Can his, the curse of your birth be turned into a blessing to the world? Yes. And so we see that, uh, that if he can control the outer space with his fingers, he can control your destiny. And so we see, yes, he allows man to, to sin, and there's a horrible uh, a situation with sin, but God has a way of, the eternal God is your refuge. There again, he's your safety place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. And so he's our refuge. He's the one who protects us. If God be for us, who can be against us? And he says, and underneath, okay, supporting it all, are the everlasting arms. And everlasting, of course, we're thinking of the future. And so, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. You will never, that's one reason I believe that once you're saved, genuinely saved, and we have to wonder about some people, we let God take care of that. But um, if you're genuinely saved, you can't be lost. Because everlasting is everlasting. It's not that you will have it. It's that you do have it. You, folks, you're going to live forever if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You have it. And his arms will protect you. His arms will take you. When, when the Lord takes us into his arms, uh, then that's a safe place, isn't it? So underneath are the everlasting arms. It's kind of like a mother who takes the baby into her arms. And there again, we get into that feminine quality that is so prevalent that we need to have. But uh, Jesus loves me. Just uh, things like how that God has made us that we need each other, whether it's uh, gender or, or people. I like what uh, our new person, I won't mention him now because we're on the Internet, but our new man at breakfast. Remember what he said yesterday? He said, I need this. He wanted to be with us. You just praise the Lord. You know, that's the way fellowship with God and God's people should be, shouldn't it? We need each other. And so uh, we see that he says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Why can we be a blessing to each other? Because we are all, cut, we are all in the arms of our Lord and Savior. You say, well, my, that's, uh, those are big arms. Well, if his fingers can take care of... Uh, Orion, then I think his arms can take care of us, don't you? I mean, the power behind these words, just the majesty. Uh, you think about uh, the songs we sing, How Great Thou Art. Oh, that, that when people really start thinking about it, it's too big. It's just too big to even consider what God has done. And so we see that he says now, in the blessing, he says, He shall thrust out the enemy from before you. So why? Because he's going before you. So how many times has God said, now, get out there and get to the job. I'm dying. This is my last day on earth. This is my birthday. I'm going. But folks, this is what you got to do. Now, get out there because God is going before you. And, and we'll say destroy. And uh, Israel shall dwell in safety in his arms. The foundation, the fountain of Jacob alone, in a land of grain of new wine in heaven, and the earth shall drop like dew. Uh, happy are you, O Israel. And by the way, the word, the word uh, Asher means happy. So uh, even the tribes have a lot of the qualities uh, and the attributes of our Lord. Happy are you, O Israel, who is, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. 
And how many times did we see you're God's special people in the book of Deuteronomy? The shield of your help, there's that protection again. And the sword of your majesty, there's that power. Your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tre- tread down the high places. And the first high place you got to go is Jericho. So get, rid of, get with it, fellas. What a beautiful passage, isn't it? I mean, God is not, going to let, is not going to tell you to do something that he can't give you the power to do. As in your days, so, so shall your strength be. I like what uh, Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, said, it, that uh, behind every command of God, he places his omnipotence. And so if God tells you to do something, by his grace, you can do it. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the eternal God is your refuge. Folks, let's hide in the, in the arms of Jesus. Let's stay close to him. Thou wilt show up given perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon the all the different verses that we can gather and associate with this great passage. But the eternal God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, is the God we serve today. Aren't you glad you, you, we pray to the same God? Now, we're going to get in next week uh, into the, and this will be the, it will be interesting, this will be the last uh, day that, uh, or last week that uh, uh, Dominic will be with us before he goes back to Florida and backslides to go back to Florida, but uh, we'll be finishing up the book of Deuteronomy. So he got the whole nine yards as he was here so we, what a blessing it has been to study. And there again, every time I, and I, how many times have I read through the Bible? I've lost count after a dozen. I don't know. It's been probably over 20 times I've read through the Bible. And then how many times have I tried to preach through it uh, in 43 years? But the more I do, the more I realize I don't even know what I'm talking, uh, I don't even know, I mean, why didn't I know that before? I, many times I'll get with Rob and we'll go through things. He said, why didn't I know that back? And that's the way we all are, aren't we? But the more you learn about the Lord, you learn out that it's just the depth of the riches are just so deep you can't ever get it in this lifetime. What a blessing it is. But to know that I have a God that if he can just, with a click of a finger, change the whole universe, he can change my situation any way he wants to. He's my God. And I want to bow down like the... the uh, Apostle Thomas did at his feet and say what? My Lord and my God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises of your protection, your power, your great peace that you will give to those who will walk in your presence. May we practice your presence, Lord, this coming week, realizing that you are with us. You will never leave us or forsake us. And Lord, we realize how the world seems to be falling apart, and yet uh, there's nothing in this whole universe that is outside of your control. And so, Lord, we realize that what's going on in Israel, what's going on in Washington, D.C., what's going on in our school system, what's going on in our city, is all under the power of your little fingers. So, Father, we pray that you would bless your people as we seek to follow you in your grace. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.